Hello everyone, my name's Aria and welcome to the Checkered History Podcast where we explore the history of motorsports one story at a time. Now I know there are literally hundreds of motor racing podcasts out there, each with hundreds of retellings of the stories that every motor racing fan knows and loves. There are tales of great rivalries, Lauder and Hunt, Schumacher and Hill, Senna and Prost, Earnhardt and Gordon, Sheen and Roberts. We talk of the great engineers and designers, Colin Chapman, Adrian Newey, Gordon Murray, Smokey Eunuch, Ross Braun, and Mauro Forgeri. And of course, we talk about the many, many great races, overtakes, and circuits that have given the sport its allure. But here on the Checkered History Podcast, we believe in telling stories the right way, from the beginning. So in today's episode, before we even get to the racing, we need to talk about the heart and soul of motor racing. The piece that literally drives the entire sport, the combustion engine. We need to start at the very beginning. Their invention, and how they ended up in a chassis and on the roads around the world. Chapter 1. The birth of the combustion engine. If you had to guess at the year of the invention of the combustion engine, what would you say? Sometime in the 1880s? 1850s? Late 1700s? How about a country? France? Germany? The UK? Japan? Well, the year was 1508. The place? Florence, Italy. The man? Leonardo da Vinci. Because of course it was. And we'll explore the importance of Leonardo da Vinci to motor racing more in future episodes, but in 1508, Da Vinci sketched the first idea for what would form the basis of the combustion engine as we know it today. So Da Vinci posited that by fitting a cannon barrel with a closable lid, combined with an exhaust fume release valve, he could place gunpowder on top of a piston. When ignited, an explosion would occur, and the vapours would leave via the exhaust. This would create a vacuum inside the piston and cylinder, which would make the piston rise with such force that it was capable of lifting weight using the force of atmospheric pressure. Which I know is a lot of science, but I don't know what you expected. So if we adjust that for size, combined with perhaps 3, 5 or even 11 cylinders and replacing the gunpowder with, say, gasoline as the accelerant, this process is very, very close to what we still use to this day. Over time, such historical luminaries as Galileo Galilei and Otto von Guerich would also experiment with this same principle. The first references to these principles being applied to what we might recognise as an engine today appear in the writings of Samuel Morland in 1661. In a letter of patent written by King Charles II on the 11th of December 1611, an engine that used gunpowder and the vacuum principle to draw water from wells was described. This idea was developed further into something that would form the basis for the modern water pump. In 1678, Jean de Hautefeuille, I've never pronounced that right, but it's okay, we'll get over it, suggested adapting Morland's design to raise water from the Seine to supply Versailles. These early engines, it must be said, worked purely on a basic vacuum principle and had no mechanical parts. However, those would be along very, very shortly. In 1671, under the direction of Christian Huygens, remember that name because he's going to be important later, Dennis Papau was tasked with carrying out research into the viability of these gunpowder and vacuum engines. He measured the relative forces produced by the combustion of gunpowder in iron versus copper vessels and published his account in a paper in 1674. Shortly thereafter, Papau would move to London and become a key player in the steam revolution. Interestingly, and in no way relevant to motorsport, Papin's experiments may have led him to the power of steam, but he wasn't directly responsible for the steam engine. He focused his efforts on the latent heat of steam and invented what he called the steam digester, which was the earliest version of the pressure cooker. That air fryer in your kitchen? That's Papin's modern legacy, rather than the race car. Now, remember Huygens? Huygens would take Papin's research and develop it further. In around 1678, he built a single example of a design that actually closely resembled da Vinci's original idea. 
a cannon as a cylinder, a piston, gunpowder, an explosion, the vacuum effect, but his effort generated enough energy to lift a weight of 499 kilograms. If you enjoy the history of science, by the way, because this isn't really a history of science podcast, you should look into Huygens. Aside from the gunpowder engine as a viable working prototype, he also discovered Titan, one of the moons of Saturn. He invented the pendulum clock and was involved in the invention of the calculator. Fascinating guy. Unfortunately, Huygens is where the story of the gunpowder engine comes to an end. Huygens himself died in 1695, and it was around this time that saw the birth of steam. Chapter 2. The Steam Age. 1712. Devon, England. Still trying to solve the problem of effectively pumping water from rivers, Thomas Newcomen had an idea. If we're attempting to pump water, why don't we do it using water? Crazy. It should go without saying at this point, the basis of every combustion engine is largely identical. Cylinder, piston, heat source. To be fair, this wasn't strictly Newcomen's idea. Thomas Savory had patented a similar evolution of the steam-powered water pump in 1698, and where Newcomen improved on Savory's design, however, was in speed, efficiency, and efficacy. Savory's design, known as the Miner's Friend, was, as the name suggests, designed to help miners pump water out of mines. The trouble with Savory's design, however, was twofold. A vacuum-powered system, even using steam, could only pump water around 20 metres. To pump the water out of a mine, which is significantly deeper than 20 metres, he needed to create a network of pipes and pumps that would involve precariously balancing boilers on ledges around the mine. I think you can probably see where this is going. Boilers, I should remind you, required fire in those days, and the things they were mining for were distinctly... Flammable? I think you see the problem. A boiler of Savory's design operating under pressure exploded in Wensbury, Staffordshire in 1705, and people began looking for safer alternatives. That boiler, by the way, coal mine. You see how that didn't go well. Enter Newcomen. Newcomen was introduced to the work of Papin and set about making a safe, powerful, steam-driven pump. He had to solve three problems. He needed to keep a continuous, reliable, safe supply of steam. He needed to be able to dispose of the condensed water that he was taking from the mine, and he needed to efficiently draw water from the bottom of the mine. He solved the first problem simply by lowering the pressure in the boiler. Less pressure, less explosions. Simple. The second, good old-fashioned plumbing. Give it a pipe to run down, and you can tell water where to go. The final part, though, well, he fixed this by introducing mechanical parts. The vacuum pump system was limited by only being able to draw water around 9 metres. Even with steam, you were limited to about 20 metres. The reason for this was because you could only draw water so far before you ran out of space in the vacuum chamber for the water to fill but you need a certain size chamber to produce the vacuum effect. I guess the best way to explain this in regular non-nerd terms is that if you imagine you've got a pint glass, you can only put so much liquid into the pint glass. About a pint, funnily enough. If you keep pouring it, but there's a lid on the pint glass, you're just going to make a mess. It's, uh, that's how that's going to go. But this is where the origins of the combustion chamber go full circle. The original gunpowder combustion chamber was designed to lift weight, not water. Newcomen had figured out that he could use his engine to lift a weighted rod, and the rod would sit at the opposite end of a rocking beam, like a seesaw. The rod would fall into the mine shaft, through another chamber using gravity, with the steam engine being used to pull the weight down and lift the rod back up. The rod would draw water with it. Find a way to collect the water, like, say, Plumbing, repeat as necessary. With the introduction of this mechanical element alongside the combustion element, the engine, as we know it today, was born. Chapter 3. The First Practical Engine 
Although we now had the mechanism to use an engine to drive motion, not just control vacuum pressure, we still need to find a way to apply that to a practical locomotive situation. Enter Frenchman Nicolas Joseph Cugnot. Cugnot was a military trained engineer and by 1765 he was experimenting with steam powered vehicles for the French army with the intention of moving cannons. There's an awful lot of cannons in this story. Cugnot would use the engine to drive the reciprocation motion of the steam piston through a ratchet to create a rotary motion, which is a fancy way of saying he found a way to make the pistons turn wheels. He used this knowledge to build the first steam dray in 1769. The steam dray would essentially replace the traditional horse-drawn car for transporting cannons. Although his first prototype was small, his full-sized version, launched in 1770, was able to carry 4 tons of weight at a speed of about 7.8 kilometers per hour. The vehicle, unloaded, weighed around 2.5 tons and had three wheels in the same formation as the Reliant Robin, and was driven by a boiler supported on the front wheel. Now in practice, the steam dray was never as fast as it was designed to be, but it could reportedly carry four passengers at a speed of 3.6 km an hour, making it arguably more practical than a Nissan Leaf. Unfortunately, the steam dray was impractical in ways that Nissan could only dream of. It was unstable due to poor weight distribution, like the Mercedes 2023 F1 car. Its boiler performance was also poor, requiring relighting every 15 minutes and requiring the user to wait for steam pressure to raise again before continuing in motion. As fuel economy goes, it was essentially making 900 meters on a single tank of fuel. Aside from these problems, it's worth noting that the 1770 prototype of the steam dray was involved in the world's first automobile accident when it crashed into a wall in 1771. Nobody knows if his insurance paid out or not. Eventually, the steam-powered engine would, of course, find its way into the railways, but never really found a practical long-term use in private road vehicles. Thus, our flirtation with steam ended, and we had to await a new fuel source before we could take to the track. Gasoline. Chapter 4. Gasoline. Many different fuel and ignition sources were experimented with over the following century. In the 1780s, Italian chemist Alessandro Volta invented the spark ignition heat engine. Far from being used to drive vehicles, he actually invented a pistol that used electricity and hydrogen to fire projectiles, but the principle would interest engineers in the very near future. In 1791, John Barber filed a patent for a gas turbine engine. I've tried to understand how this works, but I'm not an engineer or a physicist, so we're just going to assume it worked through black magic. Three years later, Robert Street built a reciprocating piston engine, which took gas vapours, mixed them with oxygen drawn in by the pistons, and ignited it with an external flame. Thomas Mead had a similar idea at around the same time, and it's not entirely clear which one was developed first. The first step towards combining this knowledge into something modern race fans might recognise was theorised in 1801. Philippe Le Bon d'Umberstein, who I think might have been in Duran Duran, came up with the concept of a two-stroke gas engine. By 1807, we had two competing engine designs for vehicles. The first working internal combustion engine, and I'm going to pronounce this horribly wrong, so I'm going to apologise now. The Pyriella 4 was built by French engineers Claude and Nisafor Niepce. It was a single... i definitely pronounced that wrong. Anyway, it was a single engine prototype that used dust explosions to power a, a boat upstream on the river Saône. Very bad at pronouncing these French things, and I speak French, it's gone well. Meanwhile, Swiss engineer Francois Isaac de Rivaz was building his hydrogen fueled engine, which combined the gas with a spark ignition as pioneered by Volta. It was de Rivaz who fitted his engine to a wheeled carriage, creating what might have been the world's first self propelled carriage. It wasn't strictly speaking a car, but it was the closest we got at this point. Now despite this, the invention of the car didn't 
exactly take the world by steam. Engine development was still focused on providing a method of pumping water or driving production because it was the Industrial Revolution. In 1860, Jean-Joseph Etienne Lenoir invented an atmospheric non-compression gas engine which was based on a design for horizontal double-acting steam engines. A year later, Alphonse Baudet-Rocha described the principle of the four-stroke engine. One year after that, German engineers Niklaus Otto and Michael Zontz took Lenoir's engine and combined it with de Roche's four-stroke principle to build the first prototype four-stroke engine. It blew up a few minutes after it started. Insert your own joke about Red Bull powertrains here. At this stage, however, the technology was advancing at a rapid pace. In 1864, Siegfried Marcus built the first petrol-powered automobile, a prototype handcart. In this same year, his countrymen Jürgen Langen and Nicholas Otto, Nicholas Otto, by the way, is going to be very key to this story from now on, they built the first commercially successful internal combustion engine, a gas-powered atmospheric engine that went on to win a gold medal at the 1867 Paris Exhibition and consume less fuel than the Lenoir and Hugon engine. The Hugon engine, for what it's worth, was an improved version of the Lenoir, but with a flame ignition and water-injected cooling. Naturally, he used this huge advance in fuel efficiency and engine cooling technology for printing presses. That sound you just heard was Costin and Duckworth spinning in their graves. Luckily, we weren't far away from someone applying a little common sense and putting the engine where it belongs. In a vehicle. In 1876, Nicholas Otto, Franz Rings and Hermann Schumm built the Otto Silent Engine. It compressed the air-fuel mix before combustion and had a single cylinder that displaced 6.1 cubic decimeters and in 1885 it would end up in a bicycle when Otto's boss Gottlieb Daimler would create the first motorcycle, and as it happens, the first true motor vehicle. Yes kids, that's your pub quiz trivia. The motorcycle existed before the motor car. I mean, depending how you classify Dero Vass's car carriage and Marcus's handcart, of course. Oh, I know someone is going to mention the Motris Pier in the comments. It's a bunch of debate about whether or not it counts, so I'm going to play it safe on this one. For what it's worth, though, because I've mentioned it and you're going to be curious, the Motris Pier was a gas engine strapped to a toddler's wooden tricycle, which he actually let his child ride in 1882. I'm not sure if that's an engineering feat or attempted murder, to be honest. Oh, the car. We're getting there. We're getting there. In 1879, a prototype gas engine was built by a German engineer named Karl Benz. You've probably heard of him. Six years later, he would build the Benz Patent Motorwagen, the first motor car. According to the Mercedes-Benz Museum, he revealed it within days of Daimler's motorcycle, so nobody knows for certain which was actually built first. Eventually, of course, Daimler and Benz's companies would merge, but the Benz patent motorwagen became the first commercially produced motor vehicle. It had a top speed of around 1 to 3 miles per hour, which ironically makes it slower than walking. Interesting side note, by the way, it was also the first motor vehicle to feature gears and brake pads, both of which were the innovation of Benz's wife, Berta. She came up with this suggestion after borrowing the vehicle, without Carl's knowledge, to take their sons to visit her mother 65 miles away, the first ever long-distance drive. She stopped at pharmacies along the way for fuel. However, those of you keeping note of the timeline have probably realised that we've reached 1885. You're probably also thinking, I thought this was a motor racing podcast. Well, throughout the 19th century, people have been working on ideas for a gearbox. In 1893, the differential gearbox was invented, allowing wheels to move independently when going around corners. By 1894, the differential gearbox was commercially available, manufactured by the American Compagnie Parisienne des Arts. I've definitely pronounced that wrong, and I don't care. It allowed vehicles to go faster than 20 mile an hour, 
30 km per hour for the very, very first time. On June 28th, 1895, it was time to go racing. And that, my friends, is a story for the next episode. So if you're watching this on YouTube, please like, subscribe, ring the bell, leave comments, share it with your friends to get the old uh, Al Gore rhythm excited. I'll read out some of your comments at the start of the next episode. If you're on Spotify or iTunes or wherever you're listening to slash watching slash experiencing this, give this a five star rating or whatever system they're using to help get the word out. If you feel like helping me get that, these out faster, there is a Patreon link in the description below. Patrons can re request stories to switch up the timeline a little bit for future episodes. And in the meantime, I'm going to thank you all for watching. I have been Aria. You may know me from YouTube as Chasing Lamy. If you don't, I play lots of racing games over there, so go enjoy that, I guess. Until next time, this has been a Checkered History podcast, and I'll speak to you very soon.